All right, hello everybody. Today what I want to do is cover our uh, chapter on intelligence. So let me share my screen with you. And if you're on Canvas, I'd encourage you to go under, under files, uh, PowerPoint slides, and pull up these exact slides and we kind of go through them together one by one. So first let's start off with a definition for your notes on kind of what is intelligence. Intelligence is the ability to reason and solve problems well and to understand and learn complex material. So obviously it's a, it's a concept that colleges and universities pay a lot of attention to when they're deciding on who to admit. The Army has done a lot of research hiring psychologists to be able to assess intelligence just so they can understand like whether this soldier should be, you know, uh, reading maps, for instance, or driving tanks, or looking at um, coordinates to figure out where they should strike the enemy next. What we'll talk about today are some kind of early misconceptions about intelligence and how the field has really kind of changed over time and um, um, uh, to where it is now, where you have a lot of educational psychologists who are identifying different types of intelligence and different ways of measuring intelligence and the different things that intelligence predicts. So first I wanna start off with this question of, can you assess intelligence? And it's tricky, right? It's this invisible concept, but something that universities and, and, uh, and colleges put a whole lot of weight in, right? You have the SATs and the ACTs and all those other initials, the MCATs and what they're, generally trying to do is get a number that they can slap on somebody to see how smart is this person or how much are they going to learn over the next few years and are they going to be a good fit for this job or institution or university. And that idea of like slapping a number on somebody rubs a lot of people the wrong way. Um, it's insensitive. We know there's bias kind of built into all of these tasks. I mean, the, all of that um, anxiety that might creep in um, and cause someone to kind of underperform on one one test isn't really a good measure of of how smart they truly are in fact that would be some sort of bias kind of creeping in so given the high stakes that that um, that politicians and universities and businesses are really slapping on this concept of intelligence it's really important to be able to measure it and understand when you're measuring it in incorrectly so there's a couple different ways of, of, of going about assessing intelligence. There's the tried and true kind of intelligence test, just this assessment of kind of mental aptitudes in comparison to others. So what you might do is give, you know, thousands of people the same intelligence test and then kind of look at what their distribution of scores looks like. That intelligence test is more of a snapshot of where they are here and now. The another way of kind of assessing intelligence is an aptitude test. So instead of looking at the here and now, what their score is, aptitude tests are designed to predict a person's future performance. And that's what, excuse me, the SAT is, the ACT is, they're all aptitude tests. So does, excuse me, designed to predict a person's academic um, performance at college. And achievement tests are designed to assess what a person has learned. So this is the like star testing at school, the uh, kind of capstone at the very end, that cumulative exam is an achievement test. Like what have you learned so far? So those terms get kind of used interchangeably, but it's really important for us to really know the distinction between all three. Intelligence test is looking at intelligence broadly. There's a lot of different types of intelligence, but like generally, not subject specifics, like in general, how well is this person able to learn complex new material? In an aptitude test, it's all about predicting. So um, uh, measuring someone's ability to, to uh, kind of grow and learn new material in the future. Colleges and universities really care about things like that. Whereas your achievement tests are what your professors might slap on at the end of a class, right? Like what is your achievement test? What have you learned so far? After a training video, they'd give you like an achievement test to see, um, to assess how much you've learned during that video, for instance. And intelligence really has a rough history. Um, it started, uh, started in the field of education. Binet and Simon, early 1900s, early 1900s. And what they were really interested in doing is like, if there was some way to give folks a test early on, just to see who, who was struggling learning new material 
so you can make sure that you reach out to those students more and make sure that you're uh, providing them the resources to to fulfill their their fullest potential and one of the ways that they they try to put you know numbers on people these intelligence scores was they were comparing each individual score to the rest of the distribution what they would call these kind of like normal or other scores shortly after that um, the field of education just kind of like took off when it came to assessing intelligence because applications for for learning and assessment and who should skip a grade and who should be held back a grade and things like that what schools they should go to for colleges and so on it wasn't truly really after that when you had world war one and world war ii and then you had just this flood of everyday civilians including psychologists working to make sure that that america was going to win the war and one of the, the greatest contributions that psychologists made to, you know, to both world wars was to help design intelligence tests, where when you're drafting people and you're not sure what, what unit they'd be a good, a good fit in or what their personality traits are like or are they gonna be a better leader or a better map reader or better at following instructions or problem solving, what the psychologist created was uh, an army alpha, which was an intelligence test, what they thought was an intelligence test, where they could give to all the people that were being drafted to give them an intelligence score. They could try and pair them with the best position, you know, the particular unit, for instance. So they created this army alpha that looked at kind of basic kind of problem solving questions up here. And they also created an army beta, which was used for non-English speakers. And when you start looking at some of the differences between these tests, some of these questions are pretty straightforward. Like when I say go make a cross in the first circle and also a figure one in the third circle, just to make sure that they can kind of follow instructions or they can problem solve. Or if a man had a million dollars, he ought to pay off the national debt, contribute to various worthwhile charities, give it all to some poor man to look at kind of judgment, decision making, perspective, things like that. But the problem is some, some people's answers to these questions weren't really measuring like their intelligence, right? If someone is offering um, to give a million dollars to the poor, that might reflect some other value. So well, people's scores on these army alphas weren't just their intelligence, they were also starting to creep in into other variables like their values, which was problematic. And then when you started comparing, oops, let me go back a bit we started comparing folks on the army alpha score to folks on the army beta, you saw that the tests weren't even comparable, that some of the questions were, were um, much simpler. So for example, on test number six question down here, picture completion, identifying the missing part of this person's face. It's hard to see if someone scored well on the army beta, if they would score well on the army alpha. So what you're finding is that these tests um, aren't really correlating well together. They may not even be assessing the same sort of thing. And in fact, if you had some questions in there that started asking uh, culture specific questions, what you might start is introducing all sorts of bias. So granted, this was the early 1900s. Um, psychologists still had a lot of work to do to make sure that they were assessing intelligence um, in a way that was truly measuring intelligence, that it was a valid test, and it wasn't creeping into and assessing some sort of other bias or cultural specific phenomenon on the side. So uh, with those new advancements, what psychologists decided to do is create an IQ score. Um, this really got picked up within the field of education because now you, you can really slap a number on a student by giving them an intelligence test and then seeing how many questions they got right and calculating that as their kind of mental age and then dividing that from their chronological age and then multiplying it by 100. So let's say that a 10 year old took this test and their mental age was 10 and their chronological age was 10, that'd be 10 divided by 10 is equal to one times 100, which would be an IQ score of 100, which was kind of normal, right? Like their mental age and chronological age are the same. But now imagine someone who is, uh, whose mental age is 20, for instance. So he's thinking at the level of a 20 year old, but he's really, his chronological age is only 10 years old. 
So that would be 20 divided by 10, which would be two times 100, which would be an IQ score of 200, which would be off the charts. So the early educational psychologists liked this idea of having IQ scores because it kind of took into account people's scores on tests in comparison to their peers, their mental age, but also started dividing by their chronological age as well. But there's a problem with that, right? I mean, imagine your, you know, grandpa, for instance, when he's 18 years old, he takes an IQ test. It says his mental age is 18. And when he took the test, he was 18 years old, right? So 18 divided by 18 is one times 100. Your grandpa, when he was 18 years old, had an IQ score of 100. Normal, right? No problems there. But what happens when, you know, grandpa gets older and let's say he doesn't go to college, he's still just as smart, but now grandpa is, you know, like 100 years old, for instance. So now we have that mental age of 18 divided by a chronological age of 100 would be, what's that, 0.18 times 100. It now says your grandpa has an IQ score of 18, which is odd, right? That when he was 18 years old, his IQ score was 100. And now, like 80 years later, he's so much less intelligent. He has an IQ score of 18. That's a problem with calculating the IQ this way, is it really factors in chronological age more than it really should. So thank goodness um, educational psychologists today don't, don't assess IQ with this mental age divided by chronological age approach. Instead, what they do is more of this modern approach, looking at standardization and talking about percentiles. So talking about how your intelligence score, intelligent quotient score, might compare to other people your same age. So this is probably gonna look familiar when you, you know, like back in, back in high school, when you took the test to make sure that like no child was left behind, for instance, and they would say things like, oh, you scored at the fifth, if they were to say things like, you scored at the 50th percentile. What that is suggesting is that 50% of people score below you. So you're smack dab in the middle. 50th percentile meaning 50% score below you, 50% scored above. And if you were to score in, let's say, like the 20th percentile, that means that you did better than 20% of people and 80% of people had scores higher than yours. Or if you scored at the 99th percentile, means that you scored better than 99% of other people and only 1% of people scored better than you. So this kind of modern approach looking at percentiles has really caught a lot more steam because it overcomes that error with the IQ score of grandpa that we were talking about a second ago. So what psychologists will often do when measuring any construct, including intelligence, is they have to make sure that the tests that they're developing and giving to schools and the army and to business is a good test. But good is kind of ambiguous, right? Like what does it mean to, to have a good test? First thing to look at is was the test standardized? So by standardized, meaning is it scored the same, is it normed across population? So it's not just you give this test to one person and they liked it. No, no, no. If you want a standardized test, what you would do is you would give that same test to tens or hundreds of thousands of different people, and then you can see what the entire distribution of scores look like. So you can see, hopefully, it might have a distribution that kind of looks like this. This is called a normal curve or a normal distribution. Where you find is that most people's intelligence scores fall here in the middle, by right? about 68% fall um, between an IQ score of 90 and 110. And then fewer folks score higher than that, and much fewer score, folks score like off the charts. The same way you'll see in this normal distribution that it is symmetrical meaning that fewer people are, fall, are falling much below the mean, right? Less intelligent than others. And few folks are falling really far below the mean. But if someone were to fall really far below the mean, that would be a really good indication that, hey, in, this person, in compared to all their peers, is really underperforming. Might there be some sort of learning disability, for instance, that is impairing their ability to perform well on that test? 
So anyway, standardized tests are fantastic and they're a really great way for educators to uh, assess really early on what type of students might be needing more resources, might we um, test for like learning disabilities if they're underperforming on these IQ tests versus the students that are scoring off the charts on the, on the high end, they're scoring really, really high in comparison to their peers. Those are the folks that might get asked to be in like the gifted and talented classes and you know the students that would be eligible to skip grades and things like that. So anyway, good tests are standardized tests. And the other term that psychologists use all the time is both reliability and validity. And it's really important that these terms don't get confused for you. So when you think, is a test reliable? Meaning, does it produce consistent results over time? That if you were to take an IQ test today and you were to take another IQ test tomorrow, your score shouldn't be radically different, right? It's not like you're, you became like really smart or really dumb like all in one day. A reliable test should give you the, approximately the same score uh, over time when you take it. And the other thing to keep in mind is validity. So is the test valid? Is it measuring what it's supposed to do? And there's different types of validity out there, but like in short, looking at the items, does it seem to really be measuring intelligence if it says that it's an intelligence test? It's not asking questions about like conjugating verbs, for instance, or it's not asking questions about like the Lakers record, for instance, because if you start asking kind of culturally specific questions like that, people's scores are going to depend on where they live and what language they speak. And, and now you start introducing all sorts of kind of confounds that are influencing their score on that test. So what you think is an intelligence test isn't measuring their intelligence anymore. It's measuring their knowledge of basketball. It's measuring where they live. It's measuring what language they speak, which would make it no longer a valid test. But anyway, what you want is a test that's standardized, that's reliable, and it's valid. So now that you've assessed intelligence and figured out what are the characteristics of good tests and bad tests, the reason why, why educators love intelligence, why they love assessing intelligence so much is because students' IQ scores is consistently related to achievement. Their IQ score is positively correlated, meaning it tends to predict uh, students' high school GPAs or college GPAs. Um, it, their IQ scores, even coming out of high school, predicts the type of job prestige that they get later on, as well as how much money they make in their salary. Interesting enough, you also find IQ being related to marital stability. So when you start seeing kind of strange correlations like this, it, it might be right that, you know, there's a link between intelligence and marital stability. But whenever you have a correlational finding like that, just, which just means these two variables are related to each other, it doesn't imply a causal relationship. It doesn't mean, hey, if I study really hard and become smarter, right, and my IQ score goes up, that means that, like, my wife isn't going to divorce me, right? It's not implying, like, a causal relationship that way. It's also not, not suggesting that, like, if you work on your marital stability and you go to counseling, then all of a sudden your IQ is going to go up. It's not a causal relationship going that way. You have to be careful whenever you look at correlations because there might be a third variable or um, – a third variable out there that could be influencing both. Like, um, you know, like family support, for instance. If you have a really supportive family, they might be able to like spend more time with their kids, buy more books, pour more attention into them. Um, and they might also um, have given them better advice and been more supportive for their future relationship in the future. You know, that's a possibility. There could also be a third variable of like how much money you make. If someone is making a lot of money, then they might be able to take all sorts of expensive advanced courses to develop their IQ, like all those Kaplan tests and things like that. They might be able to afford a bunch of books and send their you know, uh, kid to the most private, expensive, best school out there. And having the money might be just like one less stressor for their relationship. So anyway, just because you see a relationship between two variables doesn't mean that it's causal. 
And what you find is that IQ accounts for a small amount of the variation in job success. So although it is correlated with prestige and salary, it doesn't always account for how well they do their job, which is interesting, right? And the last thing to keep in mind is that correlation does not equal causation, something that the, that the news often forgets. So what I would like you to do right now is um, take out a pen and pa paper, something with you, because I've been lecturing for too long. Um, if, if you take out a pen and paper, what I'm going to do, I'm going to flip to the next slide, and um, I'm going to put 24 questions on there. And I want you to do your best to answer as many of these questions within one minute as you possibly can. Right? So look at your watch, set a timer for one minute, and then take a stab at trying to answer as many of these questions as you possibly can in one minute. So this is what an example question would be. Kind of confusing at first, right? What's going on here? What you would see is this is actually the word psychology in reverse. So the answer to this phrase would be like reverse psychology. So finding a way to think about these letters or problems kind of differently to solve the, the question. So anyway, uh, set your, your, your timer for one minute and then take a stab at these 24 questions. And then after one minute, unpause the video and let me know how you did. Oh, here's another one. This is the, um, uh, the inside story. So like the words the, T-H-E, is within the word story. So like this would be the inside story. Make sense? You guys ready to go? Great, go for it, good luck. All right, now that you've finished that, here are the answers in case you were curious. So what I want you to do now is, is um, kind of grade yourself and see what your score on this one minute intelligence test was. And some of you guys might be kind of pissed off right now, right? That score might be a little lower than you thought, especially in comparison to your peers. You might find that some people did better than others. You know, for instance, if they, you know, um, were, were, um, were uh, raised by parents who often play these kind of bizarre word games with them. They might have some sort of benefit that other students might not. So when you look at people's scores on this test, even though it might be said to be an intelligence test, what you're really um, tapping into is what were their parents like? What were their previous experience like? And not this kind of innate level of ability to problem solve. Um, and you see that over and over again, popping up within psychology, is that there are many other factors that affect people's performance on IQ tests, and that's bias. One of the predictors of IQ is genes, is genetics, and there is a strong uh, link between um, uh, children's IQ scores and their parents' IQ scores. And you see this with adoption studies. What you find is that kids' IQ scores correlate more strongly with their biological parents than with their adoptive parents. So these type of studies are really fantastic because they look at like nature versus nurture. The kids who, um, who compare their intelligence scores to their biological parents share 50% of that DNA, right? 50% of their genes are the same if they were a, um, a child of theirs, right? But for the adoptive parent, they don't share any of the same genes, but they share all the same environment, the same sort of experiences, you know, the, the, uh, uh, the nurture part of the nature versus nurture. And what this is shown right here in these adoption studies is that kids' IQ is more closely related to their bio biological parent so nature, then their adoptive parent, nurture. That's not to discount the importance of, of nurture as well. And this really, really highlights that. What you find here, the highest correlation is identical twins reared together. So identical twins have 100% of the exact same um, genes 
and they're raised together, they have the same experiences. These folks over here have both nature and nurture. The second type of um, twins who have the most closely related intelligence, notice that this is identical twins raised apart. So this is same genes, none of the same experiences, and they still have a really high correlation between their two intelligence. So this bar right here really points to the importance of genes. Over here, you have non-identical twins raised together, nurture. Looking more at that kind of nurture, what you find is that these environments have an estimated effect of 57%. So the amount of variability in someone's intelligence that can be explained by their environment, who their parents were, what schools they went to, um, uh, the quality of their teachers and things like that is up to 57% of their IQ. So it's not a, a small amount. Genes play a large role, but don't discount the power of nurture as well. And this is partly because people seek out these micro environments, which is a fancy way of saying that they like select out certain environments. When you look at their home, and you look at their bedroom, they might have older brothers and younger siblings who have a lot of books around that they're reading. And they might have a really talkative younger sister who is, who is just talking so much that they're learning all sorts of new language. Or they might have a grandma and grandpa who work at a bookstore and they're just like, you know, making it rain books on this kid. So the kid is constantly being exposed to new book after new book after new book. Those are referring to as these kind of micro environments. And those do play, uh, those do have a strong influence on people's intelligence as well. And then over time, as people kind of move out and they have their own interests, they uh, tend to select environments that fit their earlier kind of preferences. So for that little kid who had grandparents who are constantly feeding them books, they might grow up and then decide to become a writer, for instance, and then decide to read more books and decide to major in English and kind of seek out environments that are gonna be really conducive to those early childhood experiences that they had all along. Which really reinforces the, this idea of like, it's hard to distinguish between both nature and nurture because the parents who love to read themselves gave birth to these kids and then they shaped their environment in a way where there was a lot of books around. So it's hard to really disentangle both nature and nurture. Particularly when you start thinking about these micro environments when how kids can select the environment that they want. All right, let's keep going here. This is just showing that uh, uh, people's environment influences their behavior the same way their behavior, how they act, dictates the people and the environment around them. And these are all kind of uh, mediated and explained by personal factors as well. So like their personality, if someone's really extroverted, is going to affect whether they seek out parties, for instance. And if they're really extroverted, it's gonna mean that they're probably gonna go out and talk to a bunch of different people at those parties. And the more people they talk to at those parties, the more parties they're gonna get invited to. Basically showing that within these microenvironments, you have both these personal factors, largely genetics, you have the environment, and all those things interact to influence people's behavior. So go figure, who would have thought people are really, really complex. One of the more, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, one of the more controversial findings within psychologists is, is some psychologists that are being really irresponsible and not fully showing um, the uh, difference between groups when it came to, came to intelligence. Um, in fact, there's a whole movement on kind of like social Darwinism that was really highlighting the difference between groups and really downplaying the variability within them, which is incredibly unfortunate. Um, that's one thing I really want you guys to kind of take away from this lecture on intelligence, is that when you look at different groups of people, men versus women, black people versus white people, young people versus old people, there's a difference between within group differences and between group differences. Let me see if I have a picture here for you. Yeah, here we go. So, well, what you find is that within each group, there is so much within group variation, right? 
within, let's see here, this purple line is African Americans and Hispanic Americans. There's some African Americans, Hispanic Americans who are scoring really low on these IQ tests, some they're scoring exceptionally high, most are scoring about average. Right? The same way for European Americans, Caucasians, with Asian Americans, you see just how, how wide this distribution is. There is so much within group kind of variability, right? Within group differences between each group. And then when you look at the difference between groups, right, comparing um, uh, African Americans, Hispanic Americans, European Americans, Asian Americans, there are differences, but they are incredibly small in comparison to the within group variability. You see the exact same thing when it comes to gender differences as well. There was that, that, that book that was published showing that um, men are from Venus and women are from Mars, which is really highlighting, hey, check out how different men and women are. And then you had, uh, unfortunately, psychologists um, doing research that was being misinterpreted and they were saying, yeah, you're right. When you have men and women do test other visual spatial intelligence, right? Problems like this, where they have to kind of like mentally rotate a cube. What you find is that men on average tend to score higher significantly than women do. But the problem is, is look how small those differences are, right? They're really tiny. When you go back and you look at what the distributions are, you have a whole distribution of men who do really bad, most do average, some do really well. You have a whole distribution of women, some do really bad, most do average, some do really well. There's so much more within group variation than between group variation. And the same thing popped up for, for gender differences showing that women tend to score higher in empathy. You're right, when you give empathy tests, you find there are differences. The, the average woman tends to score higher on an empathy test than the average man does, but the distributions look just like this. Meaning we can all think of some women who score incredibly bad on these empathy tests. Most score about average and some are off the charts. The same way we can all think of men who are terrible at empathy, score really low. Most are about average and some men actually score off the charts. These distributions overlap so much that to highlight the small kind of difference between the two is really a misinterpretation of those findings. It's not to say men are from Venus and women are from Mars. Look at how different they are. No, no, no. The big story here is look how similar they are. Look how much these distributions overlap between the two. And the effect size or like how meaningfully different those, those two groups are tend to be incredibly small. And that's the same thing when it comes to racial differences in intelligence and gender differences in intelligence. And it's all too unfortunate that some, psycho some researchers and psychologists have written books that have overstated those findings. In fact, in fact, now you still see men and women conforming to these traditional gender roles of of what major they can pick in college, for instance. And you still see, well, if I'm an engineer and I'm good at tasks like this, and I can mentally rotate these blocks, then I should go into engineering. Even though these differences are incredibly small between men and women, you still find fields, fields like engineering that are so incredibly dominated by men and much more underrepresented by women, which is important. Here's, um, let me see if I move this way. Here's a distribution of um, uh, men's empathy scores on average and women's empathy scores on average. So again, they are significantly different, but man, that is a really tiny difference. In instead, the real story should be is the within group variability is so much greater than the between group variability. So if all this talk about empathy got you kind of curious on what your own empathy level is, um, let's, let's pause, let's take another break and do a quick little activity here. So what I'm gonna do on the next um, two slides is show you pictures of people's eyes. So just like a little snapshot of just what their eyes look like, so not their forehead, not their mouth, not their body, anything like that. Just look at their eyes and let me know what, what, um, um, what emotional state you think they're experiencing in that picture. 
So feel free to pause the video right now, answer these five questions. Here are the next five. Words like despondent means just like really, really sad, things like that. All right, when you're done, unpause the video and I'll show you the answers. So um, when you get a chance, add up your scores and let me know how you did. Feel free to shoot me an email, I'm curious. Uh, year after year of teaching this class, you'll find some women who score really low, some women that score off the charts, some men that score really low, some men that score off the charts. Again, highlighting just how much these distributions overlap, but on average, there's a small gender difference. I believe, um, I, I believe it's like a difference between like seven and eight or and something like that, slightly favoring women. One of the reasons why I spent a lot of time talking about the bias in intelligence tests and all those other things to kind of keep an eye out for is because of the implications that intelligence tests can have. They can dictate what school people go into and what jobs they get after graduating, which is really unfortunate that you have all sorts of other biases kind of creeping in there. And one bias I really want to talk about now is one of my um, favorite phenomena of all of psychology to talk about. And it's referred to as stereotype threat. Stereotype threat occurs when people worry about confirming a negative self stereotype. So there are stereotypes out there. People live in the world, they're exposed to them. There might be positive stereotypes about people like Asians are good at math, but there might be negative stereotypes out there like Asians are bad drivers, for instance. So if you're Asian, you know, because you hear the jokes, you watch TV, you hear other people talking about these stereotypes, you know that you're a member of a group that might have both positive and negative stereotypes associated with it. Unfortunately, some of the stereotypes that people are, uh, that some of the, some of the stereotypes that people um, um, misperceive um, are racial and gender differences. So they might perceive, or they, they might stereotype that women are worse at math than men, or, um, or, or Asians have higher IQ scores than whites, and whites have higher IQ scores than black people, and so on. And what happens is, is when you are a woman taking a math test, what happens when you're looking around and everyone around you is male? According to stereotype threat is you, you might begin to worry about confirming this negative self stereotype. You don't believe it, but you know that the stereotype is out there. So now when you're taking that test, you aren't focused on the questions. You're instead focusing on the stereotype and how badly you want to uh, disconfirm it. So thinking about everything else other than the exam at that moment is an example of disruptive concern. And the same thing happens for racial stereotypes as well. This is a, gr uh, a, a graph conducted by a couple researchers, Claude Steele, Elliot Aronson at Stanford University. And what they did is they took both black and white students and gave them this GRE test, right? So a couple questions from the GRE. The GRE stands for Graduate Record Exam. It's like the SAT on steroids. It's that test you have to take to get into grad school. It is insanely hard. Really, really, really tough questions. And what happens is when you give both white and black people this test, you say, hey, it's just a test. It doesn't really measure much. Do your best. What you find is that there's no difference between black and white's intelligence scores. We know that. There is no ra racial difference in intelligence here. But as soon as you tell them in the stereotype threat condition, oh, by the way, here's this test. It is diagnostic of how intelligent you are. As soon as you say this test is diagnostic of intelligence, it activates that stereotype. And in this case, the black people taking this test, aware of that stereotype, and are now thinking, man, like, I don't want to confirm this. You know, I don't like there's other people around me. They might see my scores. I don't want to confirm this negative stereotype. 
And what, what that stereotype threat happens is it leads to this disruptive concern that causes them to do worse than before. In this case, the white participants didn't experience stereotype threat and their, their scores didn't differ between the two conditions. This is telling, right? That there's no difference um, in intelligence between races until you activate stereotype threat, until you get one group to fear confirming that stereotype. And the ironic effect is the more they want to disconfirm the stereotype, the more it chews up all those cognitive resources, increases their anxiety, which causes them to underperform on that test. They've replicated the same stereotype threat again using both black and white participants. Before they gave them the um, before they gave both black and white participants this GRE test, the first question on there is, what's your name? What is your race? Are you white or are you black? And then after they answered that question, it's like, what is your ethnicity? Then they gave them that test. And what they found is when they asked for their race, right? The black students taking that test, their race became salient. Like, oh, that's right. I'm black and there's a negative stereotype out there that, that black people tend to underperform compared to whites on intelligence tests. That led to stereotype threat, that disruptive concern, which caused them to score lower. If you don't ask that question about what is your race, black and white participants score exactly the same. Again, there is no racial difference in intelligence. This difference right here is bias. This difference right here is stereotype threat that was activated just by asking some question that seemed honest enough. What's your ethnicity? Which is incredibly unfortunate because before the stereotype threat research was out there, they would, they would give people the SAT and the GRE. And before they started, they would ask some questions like, hey, like, what's your race? What's your gender? Activating all sorts of negative stereotypes that people might have about the, the group that they identify with which would activate stereotype threat and lead, unfortunately, to this kind of self-fulfilling prophecy where, where they want to disconfirm the stereotype so much that it caused anxiety and evaluation apprehension and depleted all those cognitive resources. They were, in short, they were focused so much on the stereotype that they weren't thinking about doing their best on the test. Um, and not to limit it to just black and white participants, you show the same sort of effect when it comes to, to, um, uh, to men and women taking math tests. When you give them uh, math questions from the GRE, you can have men and women take that test. There's no difference in their GRE performance on math, right? There's no gender differences in intelligence. But as soon as you ask them the question of, hey, what is your gender? You activate stereotype threat and then you find uh, women tend to score lower than men. It's just due to stereotype threat. So one of the interesting kind of implications of this is what if you're an Asian woman taking a math test? You have two social identities, right? As an Asian woman, you have your gender and your racial identity. You have your gender identity being a woman that has a negative math stereotype associated with it, right? That uh, women tend to uh, underperform on math tests compared to men. But you also have this positive social identity of being Asian, and the stereotype out there is that Asians are good at math compared to whites. So what happens if you were to give Asian women a math test? If, if you just give them this test, these really difficult questions on the GRE, these really, really insanely difficult questions, you find that they get about half right. Before they take that test, if you ask them, hey, what's your ethnicity? And they say Asian, right? You have activated that positive stereotype that causes them to do significantly better than they would otherwise. That's referred to as stereotype lift. But if you ask them, hey, what is your gender? Activate stereotype threat, right? That negative stereotype, they don't want to confirm it, leads to disruptive concern, and they end up performing even lower than they would have otherwise. The difference between these groups right here is bias, right? It's a couple of questions before they take their math test, which is introducing all sorts of uh, kind of noise into that intelligence test, which is really unfortunate. Um, and one of the reasons why I, um, 
I have spent so much time kind of harping on stereotype threat and its implications is it is easy to take away. The reason why I've, I've focused so much on it and I've taught you about it, just knowing what stereotype threat is takes its power away. If you are, um, let's say, um, a, a female taking a math test or someone who's black taking an intelligence test and you know about stereotype threat, the effect goes away. You're going to score just as well as you normally would do. And what's also interesting is the stereotype threat applies for physical performances at physical performance as well. So a uh, classic study by uh, Claude Steele took the Stanford football team and they gave them a test. And in case you don't know, there's, there's a couple of stereotypes about white and black football players. There's the stereotype about white football players is that white men can't jump, they aren't very athletic, but they can learn the playbook and they're really strategic and they can like learn the plays really well. The stereotype about black football players is that they're really athletic, but they can't learn the playbook as well. At Stanford, they took the Stanford football team consisting of both white and black football players and they gave them this test. And when they said, hey, this test is diagnostic of how well you can learn the playbook, what you found is the white football players did significantly better than the black football players. If you gave that same, that, that same group that, that, that test, but this time said, hey, this test is diagnostic of how well you're gonna be able to perform physically, running and jumping on the field, black football players did significantly better than white football players. It's the exact same test. There should be no difference between white and black football players whatsoever. But funny, as soon as you activate a positive stereotypes for white, they do better. As soon as you activate the negative stereotype that white men, that white men can't jump, they did worse. So this is really important to know because unfortunately you'll, you might hear terms like social Darwinism where people are talk or are over emphasizing the differences that creep up between groups and they don't know about stereotype threat. They don't know about all the other bias that kind of creeps in to this intelligence research and they misinterpret it and make all sorts of policy claims and incredibly racist and sexist comments you know, in the name of science. But I'm telling you right now, that is not science. So if you are getting tired and you need a break, feel free to just pause that video but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep, keep moving on here. One of the more interesting aspects of intelligence is maybe there's more than one type. So maybe some people might be really smart in one domain of their life and less intelligent in another. That's not what psychologists used to think. In fact, one of the early, kind of, early psychometric educational psychologists, Charles Spearman, performed what's called like a factor analysis where he gave a bunch of different test questions to a lot of different people and found their scores and kind of averaged them up. And what he found is when you really kind of boil intelligence down, it really boils down to one factor that he called G, this general factor. Meaning if someone was, was intelligent in one part of their life, they tend to be intelligent in all parts of their life. And then, he, and then other psychologists kind of broke it down into more like specific factors. This was a long time ago. Now, what, you, what current modern psychologists are finding is there's not just one type of intelligence. It's not just what your SAT score is, for instance. What they start finding is you know, there are a lot more different types of intelligence out there. In fact, there's emotional intelligence that has four components of the ability to perceive emotions, understand other people's emotions, so being able to look at people from Papua New Guinea who have never interacted with anyone else from outside the island, they can look at our faces and we can look at their faces and we know what sort of emotions they're experiencing, right? We can look at other people's, just their faces, kind of like on an empathy test before, and we can understand what they're going through, right? We are fantastic at predicting and interacting with other people and understanding their emotions. But some people are better at that than others, right? There are some people that can just look at you and know if you're having a bad day or not, where other people are caught off guard, right? 
there are some people that can hear your story, can hear about you talking about what happened that day. And some say, yeah, like that was probably really frustrating, right? And you're like, yeah, totally. That was really frustrating. And other folks are clueless, right? So what you're finding is even in emotional intelligence, there's a variability here in people's ability to perceive, understand emotions. Some people are better at managing their emotions than others, right? Some people know how to put a name on them and say, you know what? I'm feeling this way. Why might I be feeling that way? What can I do about it? How can I express this emotion in a constructive rather than destructive way? Some people are really good at that. Where other people are, are like Bobby Knight throwing chairs, flying off the handle. Current psychologists they would argue that that's one of the components of emotional intelligence. Being able to perceive emotions, understand emotions, manage your emotions. And the fourth is use emotions to adapt. So using your own emotions to funnel them into energy. I'm angry, I'm gonna spin this, so it'll cause me to study harder or push harder in the gym. Or you know what, like I'm feeling really happy right now. How can I like reach out to the people around me that I normally depend on that may not be as happy as I am today? How can I lift them up with me? That's a form of emotional intelligence that some people score higher on than others. And it's largely discounted in things like G on the previous slide. So, so psychologists today definitely agree there, there's more than one type of intelligence out there which is really unfortunate when it comes to like the SAT and ACT and GRE, because it's not measuring things like emotional intelligence, even though these things are incredibly important for, your, for the quality of your relationships, but also at work when you have to interact with other people. One of the reasons why I show these pictures up here is um, they are some of the universal emotions. So um, there are so many chapters in your textbook, we weren't able to cover all of them. One of them was emotion, so I tried to pull out some information from it. What you see is when you look at people's different emotions, some people are better able at labeling these than others, right? So someone who's happy, someone who's sad, someone who's fearful, someone who's angry, someone who's surprised, and someone who's disgusted. These are six of the universal emotions, meaning every, like babies and old people, people from all across the globe. You can go to Papua New Guinea and interact with people who have never seen someone who looks like you from America, and you can smile at them, and they know it's not threatening because they can infer these six universal emotions. And if you need a um, trick to try and remember all six of them, think sad fish, S-A-D-F-S-H. Sadness, anger, disgust, fear, surprise, and happiness. And the people who score high in emotional intelligence that are really good at like perceiving things of like, well, were you surprised or were you scared? When we threw you a surprise party, what face did you have here? And what you'll find is they start looking not at just like the eyes, but they start looking at the, at the mouth, for instance. So if someone's like fear, like, oh, the, you know, they might kind of close up their mouth, where someone's like genuinely surprised, it's, oh, I didn't see that coming. So notice via like eye trackers, where people are looking at in pictures will dictate how well they are able at distinguishing other people's emotions, which is an incredibly great social skill to have. So here's more kind of modern pictures of those. In fact, current psychologists say argue that it's not just the six universal emotions, there's a seventh called contempt. So it's kind of like disdain for other people. What you find is most people are pretty good at picking up those. They tend to confuse fear and surprise because they aren't looking at the mouth as much. What you find is that people are best able to tell if someone's happy or angry, but less able to tell if they're you know, sad or fearful in that moment. And what's cool is you see the same sort of pattern with kids, right? You know, uh, happiness, um, uh, fear, sadness, or no, this one's fear. This one looks angry, <laughs> things like that.
the reason why I'm talking about emotions and emotional intelligence and where to look at in people's faces is if you ever want to tell if someone's lying to you, there is one really simple way um, to tell. And that is to look at their face and did they express what's called a micro expression. So um, when someone feels a certain way, like they're generally happy, they're going to smile, right? They're like, yeah, that's great. But if they want to try and lie to you, what might happen is their genuine happiness might creep out for a split second, like a fraction of a second. You might see them kind of like smirk a little bit, like their, their, um, their uh, cheeks slowly start to raise, their mouth slowly start to kind of creep up on the side. Or about slowly start to go up a little bit if they were surprised, for instance. Um, when you look at um, people's ability to like play two truths and a lie, people are terrible at picking up on whether someone's lying or not. When you um, have people from the FBI and CIA try to assess whether someone's lying or not, they're accurate 52% of the time. Significantly better than average, right? 52% in this case is significantly higher than 50, given the sample size, but they aren't very great until you start teaching them about micro expressions. So what I would encourage you to do right now is pause the video and watch this brief YouTube video from Paul Ekman, who was the same psychologist that actually traveled to Papua New Guinea and looked at people's emotions, but then also developed it into a whole field of research on micro expressions. So if you look at somebody and they like, you know, let's say you like, you give them, you know, some homemade cookies that you made and they taste them and they like, you know, and, and in a split second they have this like disgust reaction, right? Then, you know, the nose goes up, it kind of shrivels, like, you know, that, that sort of puckering. If they don't want you to know that those cookies were terrible, they're gonna lie to you, right? They say, mmm, yum. Thanks for making those cookies, right? But if you were looking at their face, you might see this like this quick micro expression, like, yeah, they're good, you know. But that micro expression is going to be a better indicator of how they truly feel in that moment, and not what they say. So anyway, check out this link and uh, keep an eye out for micro expressions when you're talking to people in the future. Um. Here's another video that is actually your your um, your weekly discussion prompt. So I'm gonna I'm gonna skip it for now, and I'm eager to hear your guys's discussion prompts later on. So the last thing I want to talk about is there's some psychologists that thought there's just one type of intelligence called G. There's other types of psychologists that said, well, there's emotional intelligence you're forgetting. Other psychologists saying, well, there's a lot of different intelligence out there, multiple intelligence. And one of the more prominent theories out there is Sternberg's um, uh, three forms of intelligence. Sternberg argued that you have analytical intelligence, which is what most people think of when they talk about intelligence, that academic, like do you do well in school? Can you give someone a math problem, they can problem solve it. Can, can they compute the answer? You know, these, book smart people tend to do really good at school. You also have creative intelligence. So um, here is like a lot of your, your SATs and ACTs, um, your tests in college, like really uh, tap into book smarts, this analytical intelligence. Creative intelligence is looking at this, this imagination, this innovation. Can you come up with things that weren't there before? So being creative, for instance. Um, which you might find is like Pablo Picasso, you know, Picasso or something like that. Might have done really terrible in school, but was this fantastic painter. Someone like Bill Gates, for instance, right? Dropped out of college, might have scored lower in analytical intelligence, but was really high in creative intelligence, for, in, for instance. Very imaginative, very innovative. So think of this as, as kind of like book smarts and then like the, the like, uh, creative artistic intelligence and the last type over here is practical intelligence so this is that kind of like street smarts the people that know like if this is a safe neighborhood or not 
that's not something that they teach you at school, right? It's not something that people had to be creative and come up with. But they're looking at cues or reading other people's body language. They're looking at street lights and things like that. And they can tell, hey, is this a safe area or not? It might be street smart. There are some people that are fantastic negotiators, right? People who might have done like really poorly at school, for instance, right? You know, like may not um, have done well in college, but they are fantastic at going like door to door and selling things or, or selling cars because they know how to read people. They know how to like frame an issue and talk about it in a way to get people to say yes when they would otherwise say no. So Sternberg argued that there's three different types of intelligence and it's possible to be high in, in more than one form at once. But this is a little bit more nuanced. And if three wasn't enough for you, check out Howard Gardner, who argued that there are nine different forms of intelligence, a lot. I do not expect you to remember all nine. What I want you to take away from this, though, is that psychologists believe there are more than one type of intelligence out there, but they disagree on how many different types of intelligence there are. So there's some folks who might score high in like bodily kinesthetic, that they might be really great athletes, they might be really great ballerinas, that they can do, you know, like, you know, a, like a front flip or five spins in a row and know exactly where their arm is in relation to their feet and their balance and things like that. That's a different type of intelligence, right? That, that isn't assessed by the SAT, for instance. Um, there are other types of intelligence, like intrapersonal. So someone who's like very self-reflective, that knows how to describe people. It's gonna be a really great writer. Someone who's really reflective, understands all the things that lead into predicting people's behavior. It's gonna be a really good researcher. And that's a different type of intelligence from someone who knows music. And it just naturally, or through training, has developed the ability to like understand a beat really well and like play music at a certain pace and all that great stuff. So anyway, Howard Gardner argued that there are a lot of different types of intelligence out there, and it's possibly high in more than one different type of intelligence at the same time. So where the field of educational psychology is right now is looking at measures of intelligence that are both standardized, valid, and reliable, and then using a lot of these different tests that are looking at complex, multiple intelligences, and then saying, hey, based on your interest, based on the type of intelligences that you score really high in, why don't you, you know, you know, go towards writing or ballet or firefighting or farming or philosopher and things like that or a psychologist even. So anyway, that's where the field is at right now. So that's all I have for you today. Um, hopefully you enjoyed this, this, this lecture. Um, uh, if you have any questions, just shoot me an email, let me know, and I look forward to seeing you on Wednesday. On Wednesday, what I'll do is um, have a synchronous class where we will um, uh, have like, like a live conversation. So if there were things I was talking about today that weren't clear, we can spend all of Wednesday kind of clearing those up and make sure, making sure that you're on the same page. Also, uh, while you're listening to this lecture, while you're reading the textbook, if questions are popping up, write them down under the page tab function on Canvas. You'll see that there's a document in there that says questions I'd like answered. Write it in there so you don't forget. And then on Wednesday, when we all meet live synchronously, kind of face to face online, what I'll do is I'll start by answering those questions first. So, anyway, uh, hope you enjoyed um, APU online and I will see you on Wednesday. All right. Bye.